Welcome everybody to the 5G OTA panel session. I'm Pat Hindle from Microwave Journal. We have a uh, five panelists here, experts in the test and measurement industry to help answer your questions about 5G OTA testing, kind of debate the different types of tests and what's the pros and cons of each. And if you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. So with the launching of 5G in several countries already, uh, we really need to move quickly on the test and measurement front to uh, determine the right tests and make sure all the standards are uh, in place. Massive MIMO, dynamic beam forming, and the absence of RF test ports uh, for devices and systems at higher frequencies make over-the-air testing a critical uh, for deployment. With the far field measurements being expensive and limited in dynamic range, this panel of industry experts will review the options for OTA testing, such as near field uh, measurement, indirect far field measurement, and reverberation chamber techniques that would be practical for production measurement of 5G devices and systems. So we have uh, from Keysight, we have Hongwei Hong, manager of the Keysight lab in China. Next we have from Rodian Schwartz, Alexander Paps, who gave the keynote. He's the vice president in systems and projects for Rodian Schwartz. Uh, next we have from MI, Jimmy Lin, and he's country manager. Next to him is from MBG, Matthew Mercer. He's the Asia Pacific Technical Director. And finally, from ETS Lindgren, Xiaoyang Cheng, he's a RF Department Supervisor. So we have a great group of uh, industry experts here. So I think I just want to open it up. Uh, we'll start with Hong Wei. If you could just kind of throw out there what are, well, I would like to step back and just say what are the choices for measurement and what kind of the pros and cons of each before we get into a 2D. It should be good. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, we are specific talking about the massive MIMO um, uh, OTA test, and uh, so I think uh, um, uh, from the RF test perspective, uh, there are several choices uh, currently being evaluated by the industry. Uh, the first one is the direct far field, um, and uh, uh, the second one is the indirect far field or kind of cater contact uh, kind of test range. And uh, um, that's also um, uh, companies look at uh, to do the test in the near field. So, um, and uh, uh, that's also approaches trying to use, for example, plane wave synthesization uh, to do the uh, a time um, array or basic micro base station test. Uh, from P side, we are uh, looking at another very different approach. We call it the mid field, uh, which uh, actually last year I'm here and uh, shared uh, what the mid field it, it is. Uh, it's uh, the test distance uh, is um, uh, far field for the time element, but uh, uh, near field for the whole array, and uh, which brought a lot of uh, um, uh, unique uh, uh, characteristics. I think we are going to uh, talk about the details probably later. So, in summary, I think that's the five very different uh, test methods being evaluated, and um, so we will uh, talk more uh, in later. Alexander. Yeah, I think I may use that one as well. I think that works, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So as, as Kong already said, uh, there are different methods. Uh, one that we are following on, on on base station test is the method of plane wave uh, synthesis, which is a little bit unique, uh, where we are using a phased array to generate a far field in very close proximity to our test antenna. Um, Apart from that, we're using indirect far field for performance testing and, and direct far field uh, for more R&D type of tests where we are supposed to know exactly where the antennas are. Hello. Uh, I think that I represent uh, EMAID yes, to attend this uh, exhibition. So, uh, so from the EMAID perspective, uh, we support uh, the hybrid and uh, the OTA. Uh, chamber solutions, so, so we support uh, all the, uh, the uh, OTA test methods, including uh, the uh, direct far field, indirect far field, uh, near field, uh, with the transform, or without the transform, and uh, the liberation chamber. So uh, actually, we are okay. Uh, so di different technology, uh, uh, different uh, OTA test methods, they will have uh, their limitations. So that's why that we uh, uh, come out with this uh, hybrid uh, solution. <coughs> yeah, so as I uh, explained before very well, so we have different uh, techniques of measurements. I think we will discuss uh, today about uh, which uh, technique is better than the other one, uh, depending on what you want to do. So which is important is to know when you are uh, making and producing massive memory of different stage of, uh, of the project cycle, of the R&D, 
the components production this kind of things and we'll see that for uh, each uh, different uh, phase of the project cycle you can have a, a better system to use either near field either uh, far field or either compact range so it depends on what you want to, to do with your device uh, we, we, we want to discuss some of the DFF and IFF more deeply and uh, how to overcome the dynamic range uh, issue for the DFF and uh, what's the disadvantage of the IFF and the new field near field method. And so as far as the three GPP standards go, could you maybe discuss what's accepted so far and what needs to be done next? Anybody can jump in. Yeah. Um, for for control <coughs> testing of user equipment, uh, it's the, the direct far field and the indirect far field that are being accepted and standardized. Uh, there are two differences. Uh, the uh, direct far field only applies for um, for user equipment with a maximum antenna size of five by five centimeters. Typically, your devices are larger. That's why uh, the indirect far field is the preferred method. For uh, testing of base station antennas, in the standard, you will find a, a one-dimensional um, plane wave synthesis approach uh, that was standardized by Catrain about uh, two, three years ago. Uh, we're currently working to get also a two-dimensional plane wave synthesis into FreeGPT. So um, I think uh, for the base station and the UE test, uh, the three GPP are taking quite a different approaches. And uh, in the base station standardization part, the society is trying to avoid to, uh, to have so-called uh, approved method. They are trying to make it open so that uh, if the environment metrics uh, can be measured by a method uh, uh, satisfying the environment uncertainty requirement, that method will be a viable method. So in another way, it's, um, it's a little bit misleading to say that uh, uh, 3GPP approved method. Okay. Uh, but uh, um, uh, in 3GPP for base station, I think uh, um, for 4G and 5G, they have a, a different method being captured. Uh, so for the 4G, uh, in the 37.843, uh, uh, the far field, the pattern, and the uh, near field and uh, the one-dimensional plane wave synthesis has been captured in the document. So uh, uh, not saying that uh, they are uh, uh, good for every environment metrics, it's just saying that uh, they are suitable for certain of these environment uh, metrics and they can provide the required environment uncertainty. I think for 5G so far, the standard is trying to be independent of the method uh, so that uh, they can move faster uh, in terms of ruling out the environment metrics and the environment requirement. So, so far I think in the document of the far field and the catcher uh, is captured there. Uh, so that's a different uh, um, uh, uh, companies trying to provide the uh, material to prove that their method can be suitable for certain kind of metrics within the required environment uh, acidity. So this is still ongoing. Um, yeah, this is just my current constant. I just can add that uh, yeah, yeah, there are a lot of new things to be tested and new frequencies, new parameters. So uh, I think all our companies working also in a different ways to do the test. Mm -hmm. So that's why they have a few tests in the free GPP, but it can also change a lot depending on the, the experiments and uh, what we can bring to the uh, Well, I agree with uh, Dr. Kuhn. You know, free GPP doesn't approve any test the method. They just uh, recommend the test the method and pro provide the, you know, the associated <coughs> measurement uncertainty. If, uh, you know, if your test method can meet the measurement uncertainty bucket, you know, you can choose the test method. Okay, and then you kind of mentioned before there's a different test that would be preferable for R&D versus production. Can you maybe uh, review those? Which one's better for which one? So um, um, I think uh, uh, it's uh, depend on uh, what uh, your cares are uh, uh, in the R&D phase and what your cares are in the uh, manufacturing phase, right? I think uh, uh, in the R&D phase, uh, probably the test coverage, so um, how many uh, metrics you can support and uh, the uh, different kind of um, uh, uh, test conditions uh, which can uh, be used to verify the R&D design is actually um, a viable design. So uh, 
So basically, I think the R&D test will be a superset of the manufacturing test. And for the manufacturing test, on the other hand, it will typically use to make sure that the manufacturing process uh, is, uh, is correct. So it's not uh, trying to solve the problem which is uh, to be solved in the R&D phase, right? So the market metrics will be a small side of the, uh, of the R&D phase. And, uh, and uh, so in the manufacturing test, I think what's critical is uh, several factors, the space, the test speed, and, uh, and the cost. So, uh, so from that perspective, I think the industry is molding toward to some very compact and, uh, um, and a fast test speed and a high repeatable test solutions. Uh, from that perspective, I think um, this is um, uh, maybe uh, my best will or TSAT best will. Uh, we believe that the midfield, which can greatly reduce the test range from the device and the probe, can reduce the space and um, um, uh, it's, it's actually a very promising method. Uh, that's my personal view. Yeah. I would agree to Keysight uh, with the uh, statements on the manufacturing. Obviously, the need is for very space efficient solutions. And also, Roland Schwartz is, uh, is providing a solution where the uh, distance to the antenna is effectively not in, in, not in reactive near field, but somewhere between near field and far field. Mm -hmm. And um, as uh, Dr. Kong just said, uh, the, it's, it's not about solving the problem, it's about making sure that the device you test performs as the reference gold device. So it's very much about, about comparing to one golden device that you qualified already to be working. And you need to make sure that you find the right parameters that make sufficiently sure that they, that they are equal. Yeah. For R&D, I would say there are also other um, methods um, applicable that don't apply to conformance testing because for R&D you can step back and say, okay, I'm not uh, testing in full signaling mode, I don't need to have a real radio link established. And this also allows you to use techniques like uh, near field, far field conversion, measuring in near field, in near field and running a near field, far field uh, transformation. For the, uh, all the, uh, the uh, test methods that I mentioned today is that uh, uh, so that for the, uh, the R&D purpose and uh, it uh, takes time, uh, test a uh, uh, very long time just to do all the testing. Yes, but from the uh, manufacturing uh, perspective, uh, we need uh, uh, the short times, we need to uh, repeat both, we need to con uh, consider the cost. Uh, so, uh, from uh, in my perspective, uh, we uh, uh, propose that uh, uh, to use the compact range. We can use the small, uh, the, like the shooting, uh, the, the shooting box, is, uh, and uh, consist of the several uh, reflectors is to do some uh, uh, pin checking, uh, pin forming kind of the testing, uh, is to make sure that the uh, uh, utility is function, uh, functioning uh, very well. So this is our view. For the, the production, I agree, so you will need probably a smaller, compact, uh, cost-effective system and probably choose a few parameters to test, not to test everything. Uh, then for conformance testing, so when you need to make sure your product can be sold, uh, you see on the table here, but all you have the green and yellow part, uh, so it's indirect far field. For conformance, you need to test every parameter from the GTG. So then the best way for this uh, part to be, uh, so indirect far field is compact range. Uh, for the plain weight uh, environment. Then for R&D, you can have different needs. For example, for massive MIMO, so you need to generate a lot of beams in many different directions. And this is complicated to do. Uh, so you need to use a phase array. And in the uh, R&D part, you need to make sure every beam has the good shape and the right direction. So you need to test every single beam one by one and draw in 3D to make sure you don't have a bad side lock somewhere or something you don't expect. So that's why in R&D, you probably need to do a lot of 3D testing. So that's why the near field uh, with multi-prop can be very fast to do 3D measurements. So that's why it's, it can be a good method for uh, R&D. And we see in the stable that it's applicable mainly for TX, or EIRP. So this is because you need to be able to do near field to far field, you need to measure the phase of the signal. And when the signal is transmitting, you can add a, a sniffer inside your chamber as to get a reference, so this is easy. But when the, the massive memory will receive a signal, then you need to have access to the signal received by the device to be able to use that in your measurement system. And for some manufacturers, it is possible. 
So then you can do EIS in your field, but some manufacturers they don't give you access to this field. So that's why you have a limit, limitation on your field. So that's why in your field can be good for R&D, checking all the beams of your massive MIMO, and then for performance testing, when you need to take all the parameters from 3GPP one by one, then something like a compact range or time wave, and then for production, a smaller system, do something uh, fast and uh, <coughs> more, more cost effective. Uh, for R&D uh, uh, stage, you know, the IF I believe here yeah, is a good measure. Mm -hmm. But you, uh, we should consider about, uh, you know, the uh, reflector, you should be very careful about. And uh, you should do care about the maintenance of the temperature and uh, the community of the system. You know, if the temperature may be upper, then the reflector may be changing. And uh, that's the uh, IFF method, uh, you know, some disadvantage. Uh, but for the massive MEM and the MU MEM, maybe the DFF method is the best choice. Because you can create the spatial modeling fading signal into the chamber and, uh, to see how well the beam forming and the beam sweeping and the beam tricking. So that may be the best. Uh, Choice for the you know the final test. I mean the certification test maybe the, for the both the base station and the, the UE or the whole system. So you you mentioned the temperature sensitivity. Uh, how do we address that? Is that, that going to be something done in production? And if we do, how would we uh, do it? I think we've seen one solution uh, was presented, but what is your particular solution for each one of you? So. So for the uh, for the compact antenna test range, I think uh, uh, it's true that uh, the reflector uh, is uh, sensitive to the temperature, uh, but uh, the chamber can be um, temperature controlled. So basically, if you have a air conditioning system, uh, you can actually keep a very stable um, uh, temperature for the test environment. So uh, that's actually is uh, one way to address the. the the sensitivity uh, to the temperature and the uh, uh, humidity, uh, humidity uh, problem, I think. Uh, so uh, from the engineering perspective, um, this is a problem that can be solved. Uh, yeah. um, uh, the other thing I just want to uh, mention is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the massive mammals, the uh, dimension actually, the dark uh, dimension actually uh, really matters. So uh, for the handset and the base station, uh, uh, the size difference is really huge. So, um, uh, so I uh, I think for uh, from key side, uh, the uh, compact antenna test range for the handset test is really a, a viable solution, and we have already uh, sold the system for our customers to solve their problem. Uh, but for base station, we need to be very careful uh, because uh, uh, that's another dimension uh, complexity is that uh, um, you know, we have FR1 base stations and we have FR2 base stations. And uh, the size requirement for the compact antenna test range uh, for those two different frequency range could, uh, could be uh, very, uh, very different. So uh, uh, if we are going to build a huge um, compact antenna test uh, uh, range system for subsistence uh, users, uh, I think uh, uh, this kind of system uh, could be very good for performance test requirement, um, which means that it will need uh, many of the system. But for R&D, I mean, build uh, a lot of those big catch uh, system could be a big challenge. Um, one, one comment regarding the temperature testing. Um, this morning, as you said, I, I presented the ATS-1000 with the temperature bubble, and I think the trick from our point of view is to keep the high or low temperatures away from your tested measurement equipment, so to keep it in a confined space around the device or the test that you like to test that avoids problems with the reflector and also with mechanics and absorbers. Um, we are currently work, uh, we have a solution for a direct far field, and we are working on a similar solution for indirect far field, also to have that confined. Um, uh, yeah, for temperature testing, maybe you cannot uh, put the whole system in uh, a temperature like for minus 50 to plus 90 or something. You will damage the system and the measurement will not be accurate. So of course you need to isolate what you want to test. And in this method, the principle can be applied to a compact engineer field or any kind of, uh, of system. But you need uh, some uh, kind of material which is uh, 
uh, RF transparent, which has a good temperature isolation around your antenna. And then this, this can be connected to a device to uh, change the temperature and then do a normal test of that inside your system. I, I, I feel that uh, also earlier today in my slides, uh, we showed how to control on the humidity and the temperatures inside of our chambers. And that is for the DMT, not, not for the other system. But I think that, that is uh, solvable. Okay, um, I want to open it up to the audience. Do you guys uh, have any questions that you want to ask the panel? So just, just you guys talk about the environment to, uh, to uh, reflect the reflector and uh, how to keep control of the humidity and the temperature. But for the RD stage, it's, uh, the facility should be uh, smaller. And uh, how about uh, in future, if uh, the UT gradually uh, we test the, like the base station, it will be uh, required a big quadro and big gym. And the temperature and humidity control will be a big problem. So if we still insist the uh, compagriant uh, would be the best choice how to control that. Uh, well, you think the, the problem of controlling temperature and humidity is the same for any system, near field, uh, far field, uh, on background. If you, have a, if you want a good measurement, you need to control the environment for the electronic parts and the mechanical parts. And this can be achieved, you have good air conditioning systems, we have built chamber, even for uh, aerospace and defense market, we have built compact range with reflectors 10 by 10 meters or more. So it's a huge chamber and it's possible to control the environment and uh, have a good accuracy. So I don't see a big problem. You need to be careful when you install the air conditioning of your chamber, but this is not a real uh, big problem. So, so maybe um, my comments here is that uh, we, uh, there are actually two parts of temperature and humidity control. One is the dark temperature control, the other is the background environment temperature control. So for the dark part, uh, I agree with uh, um, uh, our colleagues here is that uh, we will have a refined uh, facility to refine the temperature control just for the uh, DOT itself, right? So we don't want to control the overall chamber. Uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's uh, um, to challenge and uh, a lot of material doesn't support that kind of temperature range. Uh, but uh, for this um, uh, um, chamber itself, I think uh, use the air conditioning system to, to keep the uh, environment um, the temperature uh, at a very stable uh, temperature. I think that's definitely a uh, long existing practice. Uh, it's not a problem. Sorry, maybe maybe my question not so clear. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, Yes, you are right. So it's uh, easy to use the AC to control the temperature and humidity. But however, the the, the back of the question is uh, it will uh, it will cause a, a big investment for the end users. So, but for five G and everybody talk about that we we are trying to find an effective solution, not a, a very expensive. And uh, we, if we just uh, spend a big, big sum for money to develop a very low value products, I don't think that will be the, that, that will be the correct solution. Thank you very much. I think it, it depends on what you really like to, uh, or to which level you really like to measure. There are very simple solutions, uh, like uh, for instance, we have one uh, compact range chamber which just uses absorbers left and right, so it's very open. And the very simplest way to cool down your device to keep it in the right temperature is to, to use a PC fan and put it underneath and let it blow uh, air in, uh, to the device. And because it's a very open uh, design, the hot air will just dissipate into your uh, environmental, in, into the room where you're in, and uh, the room temperature will, will compensate unless you have a really high power. So that's a very simple and cost effective approach. Obviously, the bigger your devices get, the bigger your, your losses get, uh, the higher. Oh, the more temperature and the more power you need to take away, and then at some point of time you need to look into an air condition. So, um, uh, for, for us, I mean, based on our practice for the uh, 5G uh, new radio base station, uh, the, uh, they generate a lot of heat, and uh, um, so in the past, uh, we do need uh, to consider the air conditioning requirement. 
uh, but I think the air conditioning requirement um, uh, is related also to the, the chamber um, uh, the size um, you need. Uh, uh, if you want to do the uh, air conditioning control for a huge chamber uh, versus you want to do the air conditioning control for a small chamber, uh, the requirement is very different. So uh, in our practice, because our midfield system can uh, result very compact um, um, chamber design, uh, we are, can do the effective um, uh, temperature control uh, for 5 base station with a very reasonable air conditioning system. Uh, it doesn't add, add too much cost. And uh, we have uh, various, uh, verified that uh, it works for several uh, 5G base stations. So with that, I think uh, the temperature control part versus the whole system cost is, uh, is, uh, is almost uh, neglectable. Uh, compare with the whole OT system. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, basically, you, if you want to design a small device, uh, you need to design the, the measurement system around it. So if you have a small device, you don't need to have a very big chamber mm -hmm. uh, because it will add some problems. So you need to, to design the measurement system according to what you want to test. And uh, I think uh, all of us here, we have a very small uh, measurement system for small devices like IoT. Uh, for example, then uh, air conditioning is very uh, limited. Uh, for the uh, CATR method, you know, not only the temperature and the humidity, you should uh, install the reflector on a very stable base. So, that is returned by the first question, which one is the m most, uh, you know, the cost? We should consider about cost. Some people said, okay, DFF, you know, most of the cost. But uh, you can consider about uh, the value of the DFF and the, you know, <coughs> compare the cost to other methods. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, um, when we compare those, uh, those methods, uh, it's probably not uh, just a uh, uh, comparison one variable. It's not just cost. Uh, we need to use, especially for the 5G massive memory device, uh, there are some many dimensions we need to look at. For example, uh, like uh, uh, the dynamic range, right? And uh, the space requirement, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the cost, and uh, the test metrics coverage. So I think all those uh, uh, factors uh, need to be uh, considered uh, from, uh, from the uh, 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 the installation perspective, uh, yes, I think uh, the counter system uh, did uh, have um, uh, a stringent requirement on the, uh, how do you fix the, the reflector and how do you fix the proper counter. Uh, but uh, it also brings some other uh, benefits. Uh, for example, um, the, the dynamic range um, uh, of the counter system will be much improved as compared with the um, uh, direct far field system, right? And which is very important uh, because uh, you know, in fact, uh, in 5G, um, the standard community has made some very stringent requirement on the spur signal environment, uh, ACR environment, right? Uh, you need those kind of dynamic range to be sure that those kind of metrics can be measured. Uh, so I think, um, uh, yeah, from that perspective, actually, you can see that the why. You know, uh, uh, in the industry, actually, the uh, system is, uh, is being um, used, uh, actually, to do the uh, 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 early child test for the 5G base stations because of some of this benefit, right? Um, so, um, from a uh, um, uh, KeySet perspective, uh, we believe that uh, uh, the counter system uh, 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 brings some uh, additional benefit from the dynamic range perspective, from the uh, test coverage perspective, um, but then we also um, uh, realize that you know uh, the installation maintenance uh, need to be more careful uh, than the uh, direct fuel system. I think cost part probably those two methods doesn't have too much uh, difference uh, because you know uh, you don't need uh, expensive reflectors, but your space requirement uh, is also very expensive, right? <laughs> 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 okay, maybe I'd like to add, add one more thing to yeah. the uh, indirect far field. Yeah. Um, you're right, the yeah. alignment between the feet and the reflector is yeah. quite critical, but okay. you only do that once yeah. upon installation, and then it should be, unless you really hit your chamber, it should be stable for a while. Um, 
what what you what you gain by doing that is a, is a quite large quiet zone uh, in in the range of uh, 30 centimeters or something. So you, it's pretty irrelevant where you put your device inside of that quiet zone, and that's much much different. So that's a huge difference to a direct far field system where you only have a five centimeter quiet zone, and you actually need uh, very precise laser positioning to make sure that your device really hits that quiet zone. And if you, if you are off by by two or three centimeters, that makes a huge effect. Uh, and that's completely not the case in the compact range. So, so for the DFF method, you know, people also use the equation the 2D lambda divided by lambda, uh, 2D squared divided by lambda. But, uh, you know, you, you need to consider about the history of this equation. <coughs> it uh, defined by the, you know, the, the phase change on the D by 20, uh, 20 to 0.5 degrees. So, so we don't think maybe that's, uh, you know, 100% you need to make a so huge chamber. Uh, people outside the DFI method have a big range loss. But uh, if we can find, you know, some, some method to overcome the problem, I mean, maybe the RF activator mixer for the downlink and the uplink, change, maybe the you know, cable loss should be uh, reduced and uh, uh, so people just can't see that the DFF is not So uh, the, the size of the chamber uh, really depends on the uh, size of the DUT and the frequencies. Uh, so from our, um, because as we have the hybrid uh, mode chamber solution, so we, we uh, recommend that from the, uh, the lower frequencies like 400 uh, megahertz bandwidth to uh, 3 giga, uh, uh, 3 gigahertz and these uh, frequency ranges we can use the uh, direct alpha field and uh, uh, so any frequency up, uh, up, up then the uh, uh, 3 uh, gigahertz that we can uh, change to the uh, uh, compact range uh, uh, this solution. So uh, you can maintain the size of the chamber and also maintain the size of the reflector, not too big. And the, the chamber size not too big, just use the hybrid mode. So that could be very, uh, that, that could be uh, another, another way that you can think about. Yeah. But if you, uh, yeah, for far field test, direct far field testing, so this 2D score over lambda distance, so that's roots, uh, the distance uh, from where you have an error of uh, 22.5 degree phase. So actually this eff the, effect, the effect of this error is different uh, while you look at the pattern. For the peak of the, uh, of the pattern, it's not so important, but then if you look at the side lobes or something below, then this effect is more important. So if you want to uh, measure closer to this distance, it depends what you want to test. If you want to test only the beam, maybe it's acceptable. If you want to test the full pattern, then you have a big error. It depends also on the application of your So, um, yeah, I think uh, um, uh, the other, uh, I, I, I think the other way to think about this is that um, uh, I agree uh, that we need to revisit uh, the uh, direct far field, uh, the, this, the test range uh, criteria, right? I think it's, uh, it's highly dependent on what kind of metrics you want to measure and uh, whether uh, for that metrics you really need uh, that kind of distance, right? So um, uh, that's actually the reason why we put forward the concept called the midfield, uh, as, as mentioned by, by the colleagues here. So if you look at the 3GPP performance test for the base station, uh, actually, it didn't have the requirement for the set loops. Well, most of the mount specs are for the for the, um, the and uh, so um, and then the measurement for for example for TRP and, and uh, for EVM. So if you look at those measurement metrics and you evaluate it uh, one by one, you will find out that uh, okay, I, I actually don't need a far field test distance. Uh, all those kind of uh, metrics can be done reasonable good in a much shorter distance. That's actually uh, where we, we call it the midfield. So it's, uh, it's larger than the traditional near field uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, several wavelengths, but uh, it's, it's in the far field for the uh, single element, but then for its array, it's in the near field. So with this approach, we can satisfy the, those uh, metrics marked requirement, uh, but also in the meantime, 
we actually bring uh, in the benefit, like uh, we can reduce the propagation loss, we can have a very large uh, dynamic range to support this very low uh, power environment. And also, um, uh, this kind of environment can, uh, uh, this kind of system can bring the other benefit is that because it's very simple, uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it can support both uh, sub 6 gigahertz and uh, high frequency environment. So I think that's, uh, that's actually another way to look at, uh, uh, to go to the, the basics, right? Why we need that, uh, that kind of test distance and how that's related to the variable metrics and then figure out that what's the right test distance we need to have for the variable metrics we want to measure. Um, one of my colleagues um, last year did a paper on, on near field, far field. Uh, distance and uh, he stated that it's only not only the 2D square over lambda but you can also derive that from the aperture of, of, the, of the beam and that explains why you can uh, already run reasonable measurements much closer than 2D square over lambda depending on the aperture. Obviously, looking at the path loss, once you go much beyond 40 gigahertz, you will have to use mixers uh, to down convert the signal and then uh, continue over a cable with a much lower frequency that has much, has much less loss. Yeah, another point uh, on this subject is that to choose the German systems, you will have also to take into account the uncertainty budget. And uh, so measuring a bit closer or modifying a little bit the measurement system can add also some uncertainty. So then depending on what you want to test, if it's in production, maybe you need something fast and not so accurate, or maybe in R&D or performance, you need something very accurate or maybe more expensive, you can choose different uh, solutions. Okay, do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, I wanted to move on to uh, also you know, in millimeter wave FR2 frequencies for base arrays, um, you know, do we really understand what are the critical parameters we need to measure and do we have solutions for the millimeter wave uh, phase arrays? So, uh, from our perspective, uh, the millimeter wave uh, base station um, man, uh, required environment metrics are similar to sub 6 gigahertz, it's just that the frequency is, uh, is different. Uh, but uh, in practice, you know, uh, this uh, group would uh, uh, result in a lot of new problems. Uh, in the FR2, uh, you know, we have a much larger propagation loss. So, which means that uh, it will be more difficult to maintain the same kind of catalog range uh, if we are using the same distance. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that uh, uh, in the uh, millimeter wave um, uh, 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 or FR2, uh, the tunnel really will have uh, uh, many more elements, and uh, and those uh, um, uh, uh, those antennas are typically will use a different kind of uh, uh, beamforming approach, like hybrid beamforming. So, which will uh, cause, uh, for example, uh, if we are going to do the calibration for those uh, antenna arrays, uh, it will be very um, uh, uh, different from the way you do the calibration of your FR1 device. Uh, because for FR device, you can independently control each individual element, right? But now for the uh, millimeter wave FR2, you have single RF driving multiple elements. So how can you do the calibration, um, uh, calibrate the, the phase amplitude uh, difference across different elements could be, uh, could, uh, could be very different. So um, I think um, there's those just some examples of the difference. Uh, uh, Anybody else? Uh, yeah, but one uh, important thing when we change the frequency, mm -hmm. uh, whatever system you use, uh, compact range, near field, uh, direct far field, you will have uh, probably to uh, down convert and, and convert the frequency close to the antenna, close to the prop, to, uh, to reduce the losses. So this uh, also adds some cost and a bit of complexity in the system. Uh, it has been used for a long time, but this is something that will have to be used uh, in these FR2 systems. And so, do we have solutions now that can cover both FR1 and FR2 together in one system at a low cost? <laughs> <laughs> I want it all, I want it all. Yeah. But the thing is that uh, wanting to cover everything in one system, I don't think it is a good idea, because then you will do everything within an average accuracy, and maybe more expensive than having that separating the two. Because, for example, for FR2, usually the device is smaller, 
So you can design a, a small system with it. And then in FR1 system is bigger, so you need a bigger system. But if in a big system and if you want to do FR2, you have a lot of losses, so you put a dynamic launch, maybe you need to add amplifiers, add converters, and it gets very expensive. So I think it's probably better to design several systems depending on your needs, and probably smaller and cheaper each system, and then you have a better solution at the end. So, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, for uh, FR1, I think that there uh, are so the two to be approved, uh, so only the two uh, are uh, the one. The two methods, one is the MPAC and the other is RTS, uh, which is a two stage. And for FR2, that we have been discussed uh, today is for, yeah, for, for, for quite a lot. Uh, so yes, uh, so it really depends on the, what parameters that you want to measure. Uh, Take examples that we have a uh, uh, reverberation, uh, reverberation chambers mode that can uh, yeah, can be done uh, yes, for the uh, FR1 plus FR2. Uh, yes, but it's a it's an isotropic uh, uh, environment, so you cannot uh, measure the the, uh, the, the, the antenna patterns. Uh, but you can uh, still. Uh, 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 major some parameters like TRP, uh, like ERP. Uh, so, uh, but we, I, I think that this, uh, if uh, uh, today is we only talk about the FR2, uh, yes, uh, that we, we do provide uh, the uh, hybrid mode, uh, yes, to, uh, uh, to uh, give you the flexibility, yes, to, uh, yes, to, to do the, uh, uh, the measurement based on your uh, duty, duty size and uh, the uh, frequencies. I think the, the answer to the question, can you have a FR1 plus FR2 system, is yes, but it's going to be big. Because it's going to be as big as the FR1 system, because that's what limits uh, your size. Um, is it going to be cost effective? Probably no, because FR2 you can test in a much smaller space, in a much smaller chamber. And uh, 3GPP deliberately made the choice to not combine testing requirements for FR1 and FR2. So you test either or. You, have, uh, you test either FR1 or <coughs> FR2, and not the combination of both, so you can really test that also on independent stations. So um, I think uh, to answer your question, it really depends on what uh, category of environment you want to do, right? Uh, so uh, if you are talking, and also whether this test is for base station or for UE, and so for the 5G base station uh, RF parametric test, I would say yes, that is a potential ambassador. Uh, I think uh, it's a midfield uh, OT test system. Uh, uh, I think I agree with the, uh, the uh, colleagues that uh, as the size will be de determined by the uh, FR1 requirement. Uh, but we have proved that uh, even with FR1 and with midfield, we can actually come out a very compact uh, chamber design. The size is very reasonable. For example, uh, 5 meter by 3.5 meter by 3.5 meter, we can test the the base stations uh, which uh, uh, have uh, uh, like a 2.6 gigahertz uh, large size massive metal base station. Um, uh, so uh, if we use that kind of system, and uh, it will be, uh, uh, I, I would say that will be a relative cost effective solution which can cover both the sub 6 gigahertz and the FR2 requirement. Uh, on, on the other hand, it's true that uh, in 3GPP, the FR1 and the FR2 requirement are separate. Uh, but you know, in 3 GPP, there's also some amount of metrics which co uh, uh, is, uh, um, cover a very large uh, frequency uh, span. For example, spurious uh, uh, signal environment. Uh, it goes down from very low frequency up to very high frequency, uh, cover up, uh, goes into the FR2 frequency range. So having one system being able to uh, do support a very broad frequency range, I think uh, uh, has a big benefit to the industry. So I, I do believe um, midfield approach could be very promising in this area, but that's specific for 5G base station OCR has. I, th I think I need to comment on the on the radiated spurious emissions part because you correctly said that radiated spurious emissions starts at 30 kilohertz and then goes all the way up uh, for 3 GPT up to 85 uh, gigahertz and for FCC for 200 gigahertz. Um, also, uh, 3 GPT made the decision to separate that into two setups because if you go down to 30 kilohertz, um, you have very very long absorbers. And behind those absorbers, you have uh, so-called uh, ferrite tiles to be able to get um, also the absorption in the lower frequencies. And this is not compatible with high-frequency or millimeter wave technology. 
So it's going to be a split up requirement up to 6 gigahertz and then from 6 up to 85, 200 gigahertz. So it's going to be two uh, separate systems. And how about uh, high volume testing? I think he was kind of alluding to two IoT devices or UEs. Um, is, there, is there solutions for really high rate production that would be cost effective when we get into high volume? Uh, for high volume, uh, if you want to so launch be fast, uh, the manufacturer will have to uh, define what kind of parameter is more important to them. When they do production, where, where they will have the problem. So because of course they cannot test everything, otherwise it will take uh, too much time. So uh, I think the need will come from the manufacturer, maybe doing some, uh, some production, we'll see the problem, see what kind of parameter is more affected by this problem, and then we can tailor the system to measure this parameter in priority. Uh, in an efficient, accurate, and uh, I think the biggest cost driver in production is the number of uh, millimeter wave arrays in the device. Um, because you can have two up to six uh, arrays and you need to test each one of them. And then uh, the question is, do you put individual antennas, one for each array, or do you invent a or design a positioning um, thing that turns your device? And that's what drives the cost. Uh, we are supporting both. We have a solution which has individual antennas and we will also do some uh, very simple positioning that allows you to reduce the number of devices. In the end, it's a trade-off of test time uh, versus test equipment cost. Okay, again, I, I want anybody in the audience want to ask any other questions? Nobody? Okay, so maybe if we could just wrap it up, um, kind of with what you're offering now and what you see uh, you will be able to offer in the, in the near future that would you know, provide the next level of uh, test and measurement based on cost and capability. So, uh, so can, you can you clarify the question? Um, well, if you can just kind of review what you guys are offering you know, as a solution and what you see okay. developing in the future. Okay. Yeah, so um, as mentioned, so uh, in T side, uh, we are providing uh, OT test solutions for both the base station and the UE. And uh, we are also providing solutions not only for ARF, and, uh, but also for the, for the performance test, those kind of stuff. Uh, so um, uh, what I have seen is that uh, we have already have solutions to power the UE um, um, uh, FR2 uh, ARF test, um, which is uh, cater based. We also have uh, uh, the small um, uh, rack mount um, uh, 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 direct far field system to test the, uh, the, the UE uh, uh, with lower cost, stuff like that. And for the base station side, I think uh, we are uh, currently also open for different kind of uh, solutions. For example, um, uh, we are supporting the uh, far field and the uh, catcher system for the component test uh, requirement. And uh, uh, we are also working on a new system, like uh, what I mentioned, like a midfield, right? So we are trying to use this as a cost-effective solution for R&D and the manufacturing. Uh, so I think um, uh, in the in the soon future we hope that this kind of uh, uh, system, um, um, like midfield, uh, can be available. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's my basic um, summary. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. So, um, starting with FR1, we are obviously active in the OTA field and we have CTIA certified uh, systems that are currently used for LTE and then will be upgraded for FR1 device testing. Uh, we have the plane wave converter for base station testing, in, uh, which is an electronic indirect fault system. And we can also use uh, a single probe uh, conical cut system to test larger base stations. Um, for FR2, uh, we have a number of systems uh, starting with the compact ranges for conformance testing that will cover RF and DMOD. Um, we have uh, lower performance, also indirect far field systems more targeted at R&D and regression testing. And we have direct far field systems um, like the ATS-1000 that are used in R&D and for instance for temperature testing. Um, we uh, just launched the Mobile World Congress, a smaller box that's about 50 centimeters high, the CMQ, that's targeted at production and a protocol test. And um, yeah, I think that's effectively it. RM testing at the moment uh, is for us a little bit in the air uh, because um, there's no good compromise yet. Um.
No, I, I, I think that there is still, uh, as we might we support the, uh, the uh, only uh, uh, ODA, te uh, ODA test methods, including the uh, direct path field, uh, time back range, and also uh, the near field, uh, we support the uh, spherical uh, near field. Uh, so I think that there's uh, shown the uh, massive uh, production uh, uh, requirement. It is uh, still in the early stage, and uh, so we have been discuss discussing with uh, uh, some of our potential customers how to uh, how to do it, uh, uh, how to do it uh, at a very uh, low cost and uh, and uh, also the, uh, not too time consuming. Uh, so uh, so. Uh, in the stage of the uh, 4G uh, mobile phone testing, uh, uh, so we have a smaller chamber uh, using the reverberation chamber method, and we can test the simul simultaneously uh, eight mobile phones to uh, up to uh, 16 uh, mobile phones, uh, so simultaneously. Um, so I, I, I think that, it, that that is the way that we are uh, yeah, uh, thinking about it, just to. Uh, consider in a short future is for the uh, massive uh, production testing for uh, 5G. Mm. So for MVG, so we uh, we can make different kinds of systems. So for the near field, spherical near field, so we, uh, we have multi-probe systems to do very fast 3D measurement, which is useful for R and D. Uh, we have small system uh, starting from uh, like a two meter chamber to a two meter chamber to a very big system for fr one. And our multiprobes can work from 70 MHz, so it's for more for automotive testing, but up to 50 GHz so to cover FR2 as well. And we make also uh, compact ranges, so more for confidence testing. So starting usually uh, from a few GHz to a few hundreds of GHz, depending on the applications. Uh, so to cover this mainly these two kinds of uh, systems, we are few the compact range. So for ETL, <coughs> ETL you know, we have many traditional OT chambers, so you can update the sub 6 gigahertz FR1 test requirement in your original chamber. And for the FR2, we offer the CATR, and uh, for the massive memo, we offer the, you know, the final big uh, directive fulfilled test method. So, because we can overcome the dynamic range problem. Great, so I just want to let everyone know the March issue of uh, Microwave Journal, I put a few of them back there, covers this OTA testing subject in the cover story. We have uh, contributions from all the people here, in addition up to nine vendors are represented there. And that same article will be the uh, lead story for the May-June Chinese edition that's in China. So I want to thank uh, all of our panelists today and everybody in the audience for uh, attending. And uh, there is a reception dinner for the delegates who have the uh, reception cards for those downstairs at 530. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>